When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. Fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. <sighs> There's probably a lot you've forgotten about Donald Trump and his bumbling brand of racist authoritarianism and conspiracism over the past seven years. It's just layers upon layers of ugliness, some of it purposeful. Remember how Steve Bannon always talked about flooding the zone with excrement? They did that, and it did a number on all of us. How does one remember it all, much less make sense of it? Welcome to the world of Julian Zelizer, presidential historian. The Princeton professor of history and public affairs has authored six books in his own right, but he's edited dozens more, including a series of volumes on the modern American presidency. The latest volume is titled The Presidency of Donald J. Trump, A First Historical Assessment. And it's out today. They say journalism is the first draft of history. Well, Zelizer has assembled a murderer's row of American historians to write the second draft. Over 19 chapters, they cover everything from Trump's assault on the truth and his draconian immigration policies to his relative success with Latino voters. And yes, there's a chapter even on Infrastructure Week. The authors broke some big news while writing the book. Listen to this interview that Trump granted them last summer, released this month, where he's discussing a deal he claimed he'd reached with South Korea's president. I was going to pay $5 billion. $5 billion a year. But when I didn't win the election, he had to be the happiest. Did you catch that? That was the first time Trump has admitted anywhere that he actually lost the 2020 election to Joe Biden. Of course, he later went on in that same interview to say the election was rigged. Trump apparently wanted to influence how Zelizer's historians portrayed him. As Zelizer puts it in his preface, although this series has dealt with divisive presidents before, never has the challenge felt as complicated as with President Donald Trump. For any historian, the question instantly emerges, how does one write the history of a tumultuous period such as this how can we write about continuities and familiar political dynamics without normalizing behavior that must be understood to be a massive departure from political tradition? Good questions. Let's pose them to the writer who raised them. Joining me now is Julian Zell as a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton. He's authored or edited 22 books, including that new volume, The Presidency of Donald J. Trump, A First Historical Assessment. Julian, so good to have you on the show. I'm so glad you've written this book because I've been struggling with this issue myself, doing this show for the last year and a half, covering Trump for the last seven years. On the one hand, he's clearly sui generis. He's something we've never really seen before. On the other hand, I don't want to give the people who set him up a pass because he is from the right wing. He does emerge from a Republican Party culture that's been around for decades. He doesn't exist separate from it. But when we say Trump's behavior has historical precedence, there is that danger of normalizing it. So what do we do? How do we strike the right balance? Well, I think we have to understand the precedent. It's not necessarily normalizing his presidency to say it came from a foundation. And if you look at the Republican Party since the 1980s and 90s, a radicalization has taken place. The party has shifted very far to the right, and the party has embraced very radical partisan tactics, a kind of no guardrails strategy of politics that set Donald Trump up. He took it to new levels. Uh, he broke certain precedents. Uh, but it was only because of that foundation that he became president and that he could retain yes. Republican support. Very good point. We had a Republican strategist, a former Republican strategist on the show last night who said, well, Donald, uh, Ronald Reagan would be turning in his grave. And in my head, I thought, well, uh, you're right. You know, a lot of this, a lot of this stuff, Reagan was different. Bush was different. They didn't go as far as Trump in certain areas. But a lot of what he did does flow from that period. In the book, you also give Newt Gingrich, in particular, the former GOP House Speaker, his due as the originator of a lot of political tactics we would call Trumpian today. Uh, have a listen to him in 2017, just days before his wife was confirmed as Trump's ambassador to the Vatican. Trump, in many ways, has been a stunningly effective president. He just in, in, the, in the echo chamber of the left-wing, hostile Washington press, uh, it is virtually impossible for people to see what Trump is really doing. Do you take any responsibility for uh, Trump's... Uh or any credit for, for Trump's success? No, I think Trump is a unique figure. 
Julian, he can say that, but the whole idea of invoking the real American grassroots to reject compromise, of using your floor time to rail against the evil of the other side, of engineering government shutdowns as partisan political theatre, all of that that Gingrich did, you know, he made that comment. It's very hard to not say that there's a straight line from Gingrich to Trump. For sure. Uh, Gingrich is very explicit in the 80s and 90s about all of these tactics. He told Republicans to stop seeing, being so guarded about the kind of language that they deployed against the Democrats. He was willing to use every process and every procedure to try to bring down his opposition. And he wrote memos to colleagues saying, forget bipartisanship, forget civility, uh, let's take power. And you could fast forward to the Tea Party, where during the Obama years, you saw similar things. So the idea there's no line connecting uh, Gingrich to Trump really doesn't resonate if you look at the history. And in fact, there's a larger indictment of the GOP establishment in this book. In your chapter on GOP polarization, uh, you talk about how Republicans treated Barack Obama as an evildoer, a foreigner, a terrorist, including groups uh, like Liz Cheney's rather Islamophobic organization, Keep America Safe, which once ran a headline in the Obama years that read DOJ, Department of Jihad. That's never Trumper now, Liz Cheney, who, was, who voted with Trump 92.9% .9 of the time in Congress, according to 538. It's good that she's dealing with the problem of Trump now, but she was one of the many Republicans who were part of the problem to begin with. No, and it's not only the long-term origins, but in the last 10 years, a lot of the never-Trumpers were still voting with the party. They weren't uh, strong opponents of the party. Uh, so to really have a never-Trump movement, you need both numbers that are significant, which they don't have now, but also openly breaking with the rest of the party that is doing things you don't agree with. And that's why Liz Cheney still is kind of on her own, uh, maybe with Mitt Romney, but has this baggage that she can't simply separate herself from. A lot of Americans say partisanship is out of control uh, on both sides. And if there are new terrible ways to make that point, you can count on Andrew Yang to make them. The former presidential contender this week tweeted, quote, Lincoln won the presidency on the brand new Republican ticket in 1860 with 39.8% in a four-way race. He took a Democrat, Andrew Johnson, as his running mate in 1864. Julian, as a presidential historian, I have to ask you, then what happened? Do we think Yang understands the history of that period and what Johnson did to Reconstruction? It's really a bizarre choice to promote bipartisanship. And here <laughs> you're talking about a president who is not only looked at uh, unfavorably, but whose whole career as president was antithetical to what Lincoln was trying to do. He tried to really undo uh, the Reconstruction project. So this is the opposite of proving your point. It's kind of giving an argument that undercuts what you're trying to say. Worst vice presidential pick in American history until Dick Cheney, in my view. Uh, Julian, let me ask you this. That conversation, just going back to the Trump uh, Zoom conversation you guys had that we played a bit of, what was that like? How did that come about? Were there any ground rules? It must have been a bizarre exchange. It was surreal. Uh, he had read an article about the project in the New York Times, and his people called me, and we set up the Zoom uh, conversation. And for a half hour, he was trying to sell the Trump brand. It wasn't unlike what he does with his buildings or his business. He's trying to kind of convince us that he was a successful uh, president, wasn't really engaging with the criticism that it's emerged. And he said many things, like when he said January 6th with a, a product of Antifa and Black Lives Matter, which are obviously not true. Uh, but to have historians sitting in a Zoom call already, uh, not the, the normal uh, process that we've had for years, was all very surreal and also very revealing. Yeah, you never got to do a Zoom call with Andrew Johnson, that's for sure. Um, I want to end on a, uh, a darker note, which is Donald Trump could be president again in a couple of years' time. And when people like myself say, well, history will judge Trump, some people retort, well, will historians be around to judge Trump? What will the history books look like? Bill Barr once bragged to a reporter, the victors write the history. What's your response to that as a historian? No, they don't. And in some ways, in that meeting with the former president, that's what he didn't understand. Uh, we will do our work. We will write about what happened. And if there is a second presidency, we'll get right back to work on, on part two. Um, look, 
uh, the, the victors do have a lot of power in shaping the narratives, but historians in the last two, three decades have really learned to tell the whole picture of what's happened to this country and what happened under each president. Well, Julian Zeller, to keep doing it, the book is called The Presidency of Donald J. Trump, A First Historical Assessment. It's out today, and it's a pleasure to have had you on the show. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of The Mehdi Hassan Show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.